Chapter 2 I don't know how the hell I survived. John Reed, Public Affairs Officer, April 23, 1983 Sirens wailed. Black smoke curled skyward, blocking the midday sun and hiding the gouged front of the American embassy. In an instant, the cascade of concrete had buried the lobby, including guard post one where Bobby McMaw enjoyed passing out roses. Gone, too, was the embassy's cafeteria, information service library, personnel and consular sections, as well as all the individual offices stacked above them. The explosion had knocked out power and severed phone lines. Water gushed from broken pipes. Pulverized concrete dust clouded the air, choking the survivors who crawled out from under toppled desks, bookshelves, and file cabinets. Into the noxious mix wafted tear gas from ruptured canisters in the armory. I thought what might kill me, recalled Consular Officer Dundas McCullough, aside from the explosion, was suffocation. Many never heard the blast, but felt only the sudden and violent shake of the building, reminiscent of an earthquake followed by a rush of searing heat that hurled them to the floor, through walls, or in the case of Chief Warrant Officer Rayford Byers, out of a fifth-floor window. Byers miraculously survived the fall, though he lost his left eye, broke both collarbones and arms, and suffered 14 broken ribs and a crushed skull. Others remembered what sounded like a clap of thunder as walls, floors, and ceilings suddenly split apart. The explosion blew doors off hinges, tossed air conditioners across offices, and wrenched open safe doors spewing classified documents into the air. Vaporized windows sliced up survivors and riddled them with shards of glass, including Robert Essington, who would later count more than 500 pieces embedded in his body. But that was only one of his problems. Mr. Essington, Mr. Essington, he heard his secretary holler at him in the immediate aftermath of the bomb. Here's your ear. Survivors struggled to orient themselves in the dark and rubble-strewn landscape, one now filled with dangerous pitfalls, as communications officer Faith Lee discovered up on the sixth floor. When I came out of the office, there was nothing there. You could see the sea, she recalled. It had just been all blown away. I mean, it was just nothing. My God, she thought, how are we going to get out of here? Lee wasn't the only one. Corporal Ronnie Tomolo had just sat down to enjoy a lunch of rice with chili in the Marine mess hall when the terrorist's bomb exploded, showering him with glass. Seconds later, Tomolo's radio crackled with the voice of fellow Marine security guard Charles Pearson. Holy shit, we've been hit big time, Pearson exclaimed. React, react. That was the code word for the Marines to grab their rifles and form up. Tomolo raced up the stairs to retrieve his gear from his room. When he arrived, he tried the door, only to find it wouldn't budge, no doubt a result of the blast. Tomolo took a few steps back and charged, ramming his shoulder into it, but again, the door held. In a final effort, he kicked the handle. My bedroom door flung open, Tomolo said. All I could see was the Mediterranean. The Marines stood in awe. Everything, he recalled, from my room down, was gone. Down on the first floor, Staff Sergeant Charles Light woke up after being thrown through a wall only to discover that the blast had robbed him of his boots. His solid oak desk, which had taken seven men to install, was little more than splinters. The embassy's commissary and armory had erupted in flames. Rounds cooked off from the heat while smoke and tear gas permeated the air. Even though I'd been in that building for nine months, I didn't know where I was, Light recalled. I couldn't orientate myself. The explosion had toppled walls and reduced the concrete support piers to rebar skeletons. The Marines stumbled through the rubble. My hearing came back, he said. I started hearing screams and moans and pleas for help. 
Light encountered a woman stumbling down the stairs from the second floor. The blast had left her face barely attached to her skull. Light comforted her amid the smoke and confusion, promising he could get her out of the embassy, even though he had no idea how. Through the smoke, the sergeant spotted an opening amid the debris. He crawled through, pulling her out behind him. In the crescent-shaped driveway, Light spotted a severed leg from the ambassador's driver, Cesar Bathiard, who roasted just steps away inside one of the burning security vans. Bathiard's friend and fellow guard, Mohammed, used a rebar rod that resembled a crook to try to yank him from the vehicle, but he succeeded only in stripping away Bathiard's flesh. Just as I looked at him, the sergeant recalled, his eyes popped out of his head. The guard's efforts were hopeless. Mohammed took out his pistol and shot Cesar between the eyes and killed him, Light testified, put him out of his misery. Light grabbed the wounded woman and pulled her toward the Corniche, a once peaceful coastal promenade. Bodies smoldered on the ground around them while others floated in the sea. The sergeant waved down a cab whose driver sized up the battered duo and tried to escape, no doubt wanting to avoid a bloody mess. Light flashed his handgun. The Marine helped the woman into the back seat and fished a wad of Lebanese cash from his pocket, which he tossed inside. Mustajfa, he demanded. Hospital. Up on the eighth floor, Ambassador Dillon's T-shirt, which he pulled over his head the moment the bomb detonated, saved his face when the window imploded in front of him. Everything, Dillon said, seemed to happen in slow motion. The wall behind his desk collapsed, burying his legs beneath a masonry slab that measured five feet long by two wide. Smoke, dust, and tear gas filled his office, convincing him initially that another rocket-propelled grenade had hit the embassy. Deputy Chief of Mission Bob Pugh, Secretary Dorothy Pascoe, and Administrative Counselor Thomas Barron charged in, covered with dust. Unable to lift the slab, the trio used a flagstaff to pry up the wall, allowing the ambassador to wriggle free. We all started to cough and retch from the tear gas, Dylan said. Someone vomited. The explosion had destroyed the embassy's central staircase, forcing them to climb down an alternative stairwell crowded with debris. On the descent, the group picked up other bloodied survivors. This was far worse, the ambassador realized, than a rocket-propelled grenade attack. We were astounded to see the damage below us, Dylan recalled. With each second, the magnitude of the explosion became clear. In the back of the cafeteria, Anne Damarell felt heat like an oven the second the bomb exploded. She opened her eyes moments later to see blue sky. The ground floor cantina had absorbed some of the worst of the terrorists' blast. Damarell and her lunch partner Bob Pearson were the only two to survive. The blast had left Damarell with 19 broken bones, including one foot, both arms, multiple ribs, and her pelvis and scapula. Relax, she told herself. Just remain calm. Her wait was fortunately short. Within minutes, several rescuers found her, removing the debris that pinned her legs before lifting her up. Ambassador Dillon watched as the men carried her out to an ambulance. She looked, he recalled, like a piece of hamburger. She's not going to make it, he thought. Students from the neighboring American University of Beirut were some of the first to arrive along with several taxi drivers along the Corniche who offered to transport wounded to the hospital. French peacekeepers pulled up within minutes, cordoning off the area. The senior officer asked who was in charge. A staffer directed him to Bob Pugh, who had just escaped along with the ambassador. The officer saluted the deputy chief of mission. May we enter your embassy? he asked. Pugh welcomed them. Red Cross and Lebanese civil defense volunteers followed. Medical teams rushed inside to help free trapped employees and provide first aid. Lack of familiarity with the building handicapped rescuers. Those who were mobile attempted to exit what was left of the embassy, 
a challenge given the destroyed stairs and darkness coupled with the rubble and smoke. In addition, many embassy staffers suffered from cuts, broken bones, and shock. Some coughed and stumbled. Others cried. Marine security guards in gas masks assisted. People were walking like they were in a trance, like they were zombies, recalled Faith Lee. Everybody was traumatized. Public affairs officer John Reed echoed her. It was chaos, he said. Glass and blood were everywhere. The scene proved equally as frenetic outside. From the top floors, wrote Herbert Denton of the Washington Post, the screams and cries of trapped employees could be heard. Acrid black smoke from the embassy and at least eight burning cars filled the air. Concrete chunks along with license plates and hubcaps littered the ground. Flying debris had sliced one of the trees in half while the searing heat melted a nearby traffic light. A Lebanese personnel carrier lay upside down in the surf where bodies and body parts bobbed in the water. An American security guard who suffered from shock paced out front. It's gonna blow, he repeatedly hollered. It's gonna blow. Ambulances and fire trucks converged on the diplomatic mission along with journalists, many of whom worked nearby. Rescue workers and passers-by began pulling limp and charred bodies out of the debris. Some carried out pieces of bodies on stretchers or wrapped in blankets, observed David Zucchino of the Philadelphia Inquirer. A man's torso was brought out on one stretcher and a man's leg on another. Blood and body parts smeared the ground. Some rescuers accidentally stepped on them. British journalist Robert Fisk with The Times watched a Red Cross worker use a bucket to scoop up remains. We tripped over corpses, he wrote. The roadway was slippery with water, glass and blood and other more terrible objects, which a team of Lebanese Red Cross men and women were shoveling onto stretches. American Marines, based four miles south at the airport, rolled up in jeeps 20 minutes after the blast. Colonel James Meade, commander of American peacekeeping forces, immediately sized up the damage. It was, he noted, a catastrophic event. One platoon is not enough, the colonel radioed. Send two. French troops turned over control to the Americans who guarded the perimeter and began a sweep of the building. One Marine outside watched rescuers bring out bodies. Damn, 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 he muttered. Another paced the ruins. My buddy was in there, he said. I can't find him. Moments after the blast, an anonymous caller phoned the Beirut office of Agence France Presse, the French wire service claiming responsibility on behalf of the Islamic Jihad organization. A similar call was made to the Beirut newspaper Al-Liwa. Authorities assessed the Islamic Jihad organization to be a pro-Iranian Shiite Muslim group. The terror organization had previously taken credit for the recent grenade attack that wounded five Marines. This is part of the Iranian Revolution's campaign against imperial targets throughout the world, the caller said. We shall keep striking at any imperialist presence in Lebanon, including the multinational force. Throughout the afternoon, rescuers dug out the wounded and the dead. Over them all dangled the body of a man in a tan suit coat, whose legs were pinned between the concrete slabs of the fourth and fifth floors. The employee's head and arms hung down, dripping blood on the slabs below. Around 5 p.m., rescuers pulled out what would prove to be the last survivor, who had spent four hours buried under the rubble and rebar. He was, as one Red Cross worker told reporters, very glad to see us. Hundreds of onlookers crowded around the perimeter to watch, including families of local employees. The Lebanese military struggled to hold back distraught relatives. The more hysterical among them stood about screaming the names of their missing family members noted Thomas Friedman of the New York Times. While others leaned against a wall, gripping handkerchiefs or a purse and weeping silently. Crews with Auger Liban, 
Lebanon's largest construction contractor brought in portable lights, generators, and bulldozers, which would allow rescuers to work throughout the night. Jackhammers rattled as darkness settled over the capital. With the giant floodlights, Time magazine observed, it looked like a scene from an apocalyptic disaster movie. Back in Washington, President Ronald Reagan was outraged by the attack, which he viewed as both vicious and cowardly. At 11.50 a.m. in Washington, or 6.50 p.m. in Beirut, Reagan stepped out into the White House Rose Garden to address reporters flanked by Vice President George H.W. Bush. This criminal attack on a diplomatic establishment will not deter us from our goals of peace in the region. We will do what we know to be right, the president said. The people of Lebanon must be given the chance to resume their efforts to lead a normal life free from violence without the presence of unauthorized foreign forces on their soil. And to this noble end, I rededicate the efforts of the United States. At the American University of Beirut, the flood of injured and dead threatened to overwhelm the doctors, nurses, and attendants. Chaos enveloped the emergency room. An American diplomat, her head bandaged, surveyed the scene and turned to leave. The ones who did this, she remarked, I hope they die a slow death. More than a hundred Lebanese men and women, relatives of those missing, swarmed the hospital entrance, desperate for information. The task of tabulating the dead and wounded fell to consular officer Diane Dillard, who had gone home to walk her dog over lunch when the bomb exploded. I tried to get a fix, she recalled, on who was there and who wasn't and where we stood. One of the doctors asked her to help identify the dead whose crushed and burned bodies overflowed from the morgue drawers to the floor. Adding to the challenge Dillard discovered was the gray concrete dust that coated the remains. Another time a Red Cross volunteer asked her to examine a row of teeth detached from the skull. Now... The volunteer said, I think this could be an American filling, don't you? Well, Dillard stuttered, it could be any filling. That moment, though horrific, proved a revelation, one that ultimately allowed her to perform her difficult task. I realized, Dillard later said, that we weren't talking about people, we were talking about empty vessels. The people were no longer there. The staff worked under tremendous pressure from the families and State Department, all anxious for information. The attendant, a quiet man in white hospital robes, wrote his list of the dead Americans in Arabic on a brown washroom paper towel, one wire service reported. Eventually, a nurse posted a list of 105 victims, those who were alive, on the window of the emergency ward. It heartened some relatives and distressed others. Work continued at the embassy as Monday night rolled into Tuesday morning. Hours had passed since rescuers probing the rubble had pulled the previous body out at 6 p.m. In the meantime, bulldozers had worked to clear debris while laborers armed with jackhammers broke up large concrete slabs for easier removal. CIA economic analyst Susan Morgan, who was on temporary duty assignment to Beirut, hovered around the ruins. She had been at a lunch in the southern port city of Sidon when the bomb exploded. Morgan had rushed back to the capital, anxious to check on her office director and friend, Robert Ames, who, so far, had not been located, either on the lists of wounded at the hospital or among the dead. The dropping temperatures prompted a Marine to wrap her in a blanket. Another offered her coffee. At... 2.30 a.m., Morgan sensed a change atop the debris pile as rescuers suddenly converged around one spot. A body has been found, she wrote in her diary. My heart skips, and I know. One of the officials waved her over and asked if she could identify the remains. I looked briefly. Yes, she wrote. I am handed his passport and wallet. 
An embassy officer reminded Morgan that she must retrieve all his papers, but she chose instead to accompany his body to the morgue. The only thing that seems to matter, she wrote, is that Bob not be left without the presence of someone who knows him. When she reached the hospital at 3.30 a.m., Lebanese civil defense authorities guarding the entrance tried to dissuade her, arguing that it was too grisly. But Morgan refused. She climbed the rail and pushed inside the hospital. In the morgue, she counted five other victims on the floor alongside her friend, Bob Ames. Before her lay the remains, not only of America's top Middle East intelligence expert, but also a husband and a father. I retrieve Bob's wedding ring, she wrote. Pray for his soul and tell him goodbye.